Welcome back to First Rounds on Me, the podcast about dating, relationships, love, sex, and everything in between. I'm Steve, along with my co-host and First Rounds on Me founder and CEO, Joe Feminella. If you're completely new to First Rounds on Me, we're a dating app that cuts out all the small talk and encourages you to actually go on real dates so you can create a real, genuine connection in person rather than trying to through a phone screen. If you haven't downloaded from yet, go to the App Store, create your profile, find yourself a date, fall in love, and make some beautiful babies. If we're not in your city yet, we're working to get there as soon as possible, so hang tight and thank you for your patience. If you're loving the app, please consider leaving us a rating and review on the App Store. We love getting your feedback and it really helps us grow. If you have a From Success story, we'd love to hear all about it and feature you on our social media. Today is May 4th. May the 4th be with you. It's also Mental Health Awareness Month, and we have an incredible and timely guest in Nicole Gibson. Nicole is a multi-award winning social entrepreneur and an unstoppable messenger of love and human potential. She's a fierce ambassador for mental health, innovation, and connection. She was the youngest Commonwealth Commissioner for Mental Health in history during her three-year term, advising directly to the Australian Federal Health Minister and Prime Minister. Nicole, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Mm. Our most, yeah. our most uh, established guest, I think, working <laughs> yeah, for the government at such a young age. Nice. So let's talk about sex. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> well, we do love, I like to start with this question as like a real deal check-in. Mm-hmm. How are you right now at this point in time? Like legitimately, not just like, eh, I'm good. I would never give such an arbitrary answer. I don't know. Um, so we'll see. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Um, I think I'm doing well. Yeah, genuinely. I feel like... It's been um, a huge year, like a whole year, not just the first five months of this year, but the last 12 months. And I feel like I've been like really forced to grow in seriously intense and and wonderful and exponential ways. And now I'm finally kind of seeing the fruits of that growth. Amazing. And you're a little jet lagged, I assume. No, not jet lagged. I don't believe in jet lag. That's that's how you get over it. Okay, nice. You just unsubscribe. I love that. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to start with a question in, in doing some research. Um, well, okay, well, I'll start here because, you know, people that don't know you, mm-hmm. it seems like you're one of those people that has a million things going on. So how do you best sum up who you are and what you do? Um, I'm a lover of love. Okay. Yeah. And I would say that that's, that's kind of the, the most fundamental and everything else is an expression of that. Mm. Yeah. I, um, I met the power of love in my own healing journey when I was younger and love and compassion. And now all of my pursuits are just a, a way to become more effective at bringing that to the world. Okay. And how do you define love? It's a state of being, um, the natural state that we are, um, where we came from, where we're going back to, the ending, the beginning. How poetic do you want me to get? As poetic as you want, yeah. <laughs> I think love's been really romanticized and, and almost in a way to its detriment. Um, and I say that and I'm the biggest romantic ever, so not to disregard it. But I do think the world is so in need of love just for the sake of love, you know, like loving out loud obviously is my ethos in life. And to me, that means meeting the truth of who you are and learning to express that unapologetically without limitations without conditions like learning to just give and express the essence of who you are Mm -hmm. no matter what that looks like or you know how it might be perceived or judged or whatever because i think that at the end of the day that's where we find the most fulfillment and growth and healing and it's going to give us the best possibility to actually meet our true potential Mm. i love that yeah it's nice so i so we met at so house right and you know we told the story on your podcast today and how you know, we really vibe and, you know, when you meet people who are on the same wavelength and have the same mission in life, it's really easy to connect, right? Mm-hmm. But I didn't really, we, we talked a little bit about how Love Out Loud started, mm-hmm. but can you tell us a little bit more about, A, being the youngest health commissioner, how that happened, and kind of what, like, snowballed all this into being a career and being something like you're so passionate about, and how, how you kind of became an expert so mm-hmm. young and so early. Yeah, it's a, it's a big story, right? And to go right, right back, um, I went to a performing arts school instead of a high school, and my dream was to uh, perform. 
Um, and the reason I love performance, I can now kind of understand in hindsight, was because there's this experience when you perform, and it's the same experience I have when I speak to a live audience in particular, that everyone's present. You know, if you're if you're a good performer, there's a presence in the room which is so palpable and and special. And that was something that I always really craved and I felt like was really missing from the world. Um, and yeah, so I made a decision young to, to do everything I could to pursue that. But I didn't have the, the foundations of, of self-love. I didn't have the foundations of self-belief and I didn't have the love around me because it was a highly kind of competitive environment um, to, to make the best of the opportunities I had at the time. And those pressures compounded into my own mental health challenges, which ultimately became a life-threatening eating disorder. And in that experience, it was really fascinating because I really got to meet the relationship the majority of society has with vulnerability. And I think this is something that um, with mental health, often the scars are very invisible. You know, if you're dealing with depression or anxiety, it's not, un unless I guess maybe you've been through it, it's not always easy to tell. But because what I went through was so visible, um, it, I was meeting that reaction all the time when I was in conversations with people. And I got to really experience what it felt like, A, to kind of be that, that subject of discomfort because it put people on edge. But also in a more general sense, I got to see that for the most part, we're really uncomfortable with vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, and now I can see, and through my healing, I started to see that it really had nothing to do with me, but what I represented and the fact that people, you know, in the presence of something or someone that, that looked vulnerable, looked fragile, they didn't want to be present with that in themselves. And so the only thing left to do is kind of avoid, push away, um, kind of pretend like it's not there. And through my healing journey, I really started to ask the question, well, if we can't be present with pain and vulnerability and suffering and, you know, discomfort, how else is this affecting our world? And so it catalyzed me to sort of ask very meaningful questions, which put a frame and a lens over my life that I couldn't, you know, after an experience like that, I couldn't just go and get a nine to five job. Like it wasn't really an option because I, it was so obviously something that society was missing. Um, and also my school principal, who was like the least likely candidate to be this sort of person and angel in my life was the, the one to have that really challenging conversation with me. And he was this like alpha dude, triathlete, you know, 50 something. And I was a 16 year old girl dealing with anorexia and he was so uncomfortable. I could see the day that he approached me. He wasn't comfortable in that situation, mm -hmm. but he was brave. He was brave enough to have that conversation. And he asked me to come and have a chat with him in his office. And immediately I knew that he was going to address my health, but I felt so ashamed of what I was going through that my impulse was like, I'm going to get in trouble, you know? And I just wanted to run so far away from having that conversation with him. Oh, he's a triathlete, so. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you don't want to get in trouble, you know, from from, <laughs> from a guy like that. Uh, let alone your principal. Um, and also, like the dichotomy of that, I started to recognize. If you would ask me in a quiet moment at that time, what's the thing that you want the most? You know, that you crave the most, and it was for someone to notice and care about what I was going through. Mm. And as soon as it was there, I wanted to run in the other direction. And isn't that so true for so yeah. many things in life? You know, we, as soon as our manifestation is there, it, it overwhelms us and, and we want to push it away. Um, but I didn't do that. I followed him to his office and I was so scared that when I opened his office door, I couldn't even sit on the other side of his desk where you would normally sit. I went and sat in the corner of his room and I braced myself because I thought I was going to get yelled at. And he held this silence that felt like forever. It was probably only five seconds. And then he asked me a question. Um, sorry, he said, Nicole, I just want you to know that you're not a, uh, that you're not alone in what you're going through right now. And it was such a simple thing to say, you know. I just, 
had never felt like all of me was welcome like that. And I burst in, into tears and I cried for, for like 30 minutes. And he didn't try to stop me from crying. He didn't kind of, Aussie culture can be a bit, you know, <laughs> rough sometimes, you know, tap you on the back and you'll be right, mate. <laughs> he, he didn't do that. He just let me cry and he just held space. And then after 30 minutes, he asked me a question and he, he, he said to me, do you know what my favorite thing to do after school is? It always has been since the beginning of my education career, 30 years. And I shook my head still crying and he said my favorite thing has always been to have a beer and I think my thought was are you going to tell me that's the answer to my problems or where are you going with this and he said I want to make you a deal and he got out a piece of paper from his desk and he wrote on the piece of paper um I won't have a beer until you hit your weight target and he signed it as if it was a contract and he put it on his um on his wall next to his desk. And I just looked at it in total disbelief because keep in mind that at that time I felt, you know, invisible and I felt unimportant. And I really couldn't understand why someone would give up something they loved just to help me feel less alone. It was a very foreign concept. Um, And all I could ask him was why, why would you do that? And he said, I'm never gonna understand what it's like to be a 16 year old teenage girl going through what you're going through but I know what it feels like to be a human that's struggling and I know what it feels like to be going through that alone and I just want you to know that you're really not alone in this and that conversation definitely changed the trajectory of my life potentially it saved my life um and it's not that there was a magic wand that all of a sudden I woke up the next day and I was I was healed from the grips of the eating disorder um because you know recovery was a very real and difficult journey but it was also a very clinical journey at times and it was his love and his light and his compassion and feeling like there was someone that was willing to be in that with me Mm. that really was a saving grace um and i recognized you know i was very exposed through those um next couple of years to the realities of the health system and I think the health system is a really strong magnifying glass to society because it's the health system you're you're dealing often with people that are in the most um, vulnerable situations and they're subjects a lot of the time and I think that that's how we unconsciously treat each other a lot of the time because we're not connected to that humanity we don't we're not connected to that love and you know now in you know, more modern, modern times, we're kind of dealing with this exponential advancement of tech. And this is obviously something I care about deeply with what we're creating. But I don't feel like we've hit a point of spiritual maturity and connection to, you know, our humanity and our spirit in a way that's going to create a more utopian world. I think we, we need more than ever to kind of advance um, our connectedness yeah. so that however we evolve, you know, in the coming decades is, is firstly anchored in that. Yeah, but for me coming out of that journey, I just knew that's what I wanted to do in the world. Mm. Um, and I wasn't going to stop, you know, until <laughs> I'd done everything I could to, I don't know, make the world fall in love with each other, I guess. Um, as an 18 year old, that looks like me buying a van and literally traveling to remote communities around Australia. And, um, creating spaces for people to come and share their stories, which was like one of the most taboo things you could be doing in remote parts of Australia 12 years ago, let me tell you. But it had this momentum, you know, I went from um, having, you know, maybe two or three people rock up to these things, to being invited to communities, to um, having audiences of a hundred and a thousand and five thousand. And, you know, I've been asked before, like, how did that happen? And I think, my reflection is when there was like two people in that space i listened to them and i cared about them and i loved them as if it was the audience of ten thousand, you know mm-hmm. and just naturally it it grew it evolved yeah and we always say that about treating each person right because obviously our hope is to get as many users as possible right mm-hmm. hundreds and thousands millions right but treating each individual totally. user so personally, right? And treating them as if they're seen, not just like 
hey, we hope you use our dating app and pay for it and make us money. It's like, no, like if you have a problem or an issue, yeah. our goal is to help you specifically figure out any hurdles you may have in the dating game. And, you know, we want to make it so personal, but yeah. you touched on so many, so many things there, which were amazing. Did you see the, this, the uh, U.S. Surgeon General came out with um, an article saying that the U.S. is in an epidemic of loneliness? Yeah. And it's based off of all this technological, you know, advances and stats. And how, just like you said, humans are just not, they're not emotionally mature enough to mm. deal with all this technology. And I think what you're doing specifically and what we're trying to do is hopefully going to reverse some of that advancement in a good way. Yeah, 100%. It's, um, you know, like, I think this kind of culture probably that's come from maybe you know our generation's parents who were raised by parents from war you know so there's a very real impact on mm -hmm. that and, and how it kind of how you have to deal with emotion and um my lineage is british and so i think in particular brits right they don't love talking about emotions but it's kind of celebrated and seen as stoic to to not be emotional but the reality is 80 percent of a human being is emotionally driven and, and those that think they're most rational are usually you know the most off off par we're emotional creatures emotion is energy in motion and when you look at nature nature is not resisting its conditions you know nature is fully present with its conditions the the tree in winter um if you're not in la you know <laughs> is 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 not holding on it's allowing itself to actually surrender to the reality of winter and that's true strength yeah you know? that's true strength and true resilience and we see examples of it in the natural world all the time and i think we've been really messed up by this um relationship with emotion which is well i'm not strong unless i just feel good things all the time right unless i always feel good about myself unless i always feel secure like you'd be a robot you know, there's no humanity in that. Yeah, and I think... You've got to go through the struggle, you know, to be human. Yeah, and I think that that is the issue with the world moving forward is that some of this technology is trying to make us robotic, right? And like mm -hmm. you said, when you first wanted to get into the arts, right, the most beautiful thing about the arts is that the, the imperfection makes it perfect yeah. because everybody's taste is unique and it really hits them in the soul. Mm -hmm. And if you could do that with so many different people, that's the most amazing thing. But if you try and perfect that, we're going to be robots. Like, okay, we all like that song. Let's all go listen to it, go home, and just be happy to listen to that song. Totally. Um, but also what you were saying about this guy, right? Like, he's a triathlete. He's probably a manly man. But the strongest thing he did was create a profound moment for you by being vulnerable yeah. and creating. And I think that's, that's the best way to put it for men is like mm. you're, when you're vulnerable, you're creating a safe space and being so open with somebody else mm. that you're allowing them to be the best version of themselves and hopefully grow and flourish because they trust in you. And I think it yeah. takes a strong man to create that environment to say, Hey, you know, talking about our emotions could be, you know, mm. not as physically manly as we like, but mm. creating a safe space for someone to change their life and trust me is right. as manly as it gets. 100%. And like, I mean, I can only assume, but I uh, grew up with two brothers, so I got to witness the development, you know, of, of, of men. And um, I think, you know, what I could see was their desire for... Um, you know the assertion of strength where that becomes most applicable is when in relation to a, a female when when the woman is willing to be vulnerable and soft then there's actually a reason potentially to assert your strength to, to protect and to, to be there for and if you're just asserting strength you know if, if it's power for power's sake what's the point yeah but if it's power with love that's incredibly powerful yeah, I think, yeah, powerful love. I'm, I'm going to start using that. That's amazing. Mm. And I think, like, even when you're in a relationship, I think knowing that men and women speak totally different languages, it's obvious, right? Mm. But when you love somebody, giving them that that space to be heard 
right? Mm -hmm. Knowing that you might not agree, but that they feel comfortable and safe to express how they feel, yeah. knowing they're not going to be judged by you, knowing that there's going to be no physical or mental attack, yeah. and just saying, listen, I know oh, you're yeah. feeling some type of way, but you're in a safe zone and I'm going to protect you and allow you to just explain that situation to me yeah. and just be heard. Exactly. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's like ju judge it as, as weak until you try to do it, you know, <laughs> because actually revealing your cards is, um, honesty, it's the greatest risk, you know, when you're, when you're totally honest with whatever you're feeling or going through or what's on your mind, you have no control over how that's perceived. You know, it takes it takes a huge amount of courage and strength actually to to show up in that. Because um, the alternative is is when you're doing everything you can to kind of manipulate a situation to be perceived in in a way that you would like. And I think that um, strength has really been misunderstood and related to in that way for way too long. That if I can get people to see me as strong you know, whatever that definition is in, in the person's mind, then, you know, I'll be safe. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think we see it in the dating world, right? If, if you have two people that go on, say, five dates, right? And every time they're on a date, they're talking like, oh, everything's great. How's everything with you? Oh, it's great. Everything's going so amazing. That can only happen for so long until you get to a point where it's <laughs> yeah. like, <Come> on. <laughs> well, I'm not going to fully get to connect with you and know you until mm -hmm. I hear some of your vulnerabilities or hear some of the things you're passionate about or some of the issues you deal with in life so that we could like talk about deep things. Yeah. And if, if every day for the rest of your life is, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Oh, I'm great. Life's great. What There's going to be no deep connection there. Yeah, totally. Which, which you're great at, Joe. You're great at putting it on the table. <laughs> yeah. I try. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Do you still talk to the principal? Um, we, we have spoken. Does he know that he... You know, really change the course. Okay. Yeah, hundred percent. And uh, go ahead. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Short answer. Well, I was, yeah. I was wondering also, what was your relationship like before that moment? Sort of non-existent. Okay. But I think um, because it my health kind of deteriorated over time, it became you know probably a subject of conversation because ultimately my educators had a duty of care. Had a duty of care. Yeah, they had a responsibility. Yeah. I think by by the time it got to that, to, to intervene, um, but it's it's such a sensitive conversation. It's a very mm -hmm. hard conversation to approach someone, um, you know. And I, I guess out of all the educators, he was the one that, that was willing to kind of demonstrate that leadership. Yeah, and I wonder if it was a combination of you know him. I'm assuming he was in pretty good physical shape, right? So maybe he was able to recognize that you were struggling because of his, the way he took care of himself, maybe? At least, at least a little bit? Um, <clears throat> I don't know, like, the, the, perhaps. I think, I think underneath, he had been through his own pain. Mm. I, I don't, I don't know if it had anything to do with the physicality, you know, I think, I think it was empathy. Although he'd never struggled with anorexia, I felt from him a true understanding of what it, of what struggle really feels like mm -hmm. on an emotional on an emotional and, and mental level and I think that's the biggest gift you get from going through a hardship like that you know and especially because not everyone goes through that early in life I think at some point we have to deal with the realities of grief and loss and you know life will force us to address those very difficult um, emotions at some point even if it's you know, your final breath. Some people will resist it until the very end. Um, but yeah, if you've been been put in situations where, where life has kind of forced you to, to get present with, with those uncomfortable emotions younger, the gift is you develop this sixth sense. Mm -hmm. You know, like I can very easily tell that someone's not okay. Yeah. And, and I, I didn't realize actually until probably later in my, 20s that that wasn't something everyone had that that social and emotional awareness wasn't kind of commonplace yeah that's a well i was gonna say and there's that old cliche of if, if your life touches one other person's life and your life is worth living right 
And I think a lot of people don't put that into actual practice because maybe they think it's not true or they think it's a bigger test than, mm. you know, than, than is possible. But yeah. this guy seems to be like a perfect example of he was a profound person in your life, right? So mm. we could say that he changed your life for the better, right? Yeah. And then just by doing that, now you're changing totally. thousands and thousands of lives. Yeah. And if everybody just lived with that mentality of, okay, the goal for my life is when I leave this earth to at least have touched one person positively, totally. because you don't know yeah. what that one interaction could do for that other person. And you're a perfect example because now you're changing thousands of lives, right? Now, of all those thousands of people, say they each change 10 lives each, right? You have now started a web of hundreds of thousands of people just based off of one simple profound interaction of this mm -hmm. guy going out of his way to make one person feel better. If the whole world did that, we would be so far better off as, mm -hmm. as a society, as humanity, as, as a world, as a community, just yeah. based off of treating other people in a good way. Let's address, because there's, there's an important nuance in this, right? Because in Australia, we have a um, mental health campaign called Are You OK Day? And you know, it's, it's, it's beautifully intended because it's a day where you're reminded to ask the people around you how they're really doing. Mm -hmm. But the challenge is it's not equipping people if your friend turned around and said, actually, no, I'm not doing OK. You know, like... So there's two levels to this kind of transformation to really make a, a truly meaningful impact on someone's life the way that my principal did for me that I think is often overlooked. And the first is you've got to show up and, and be aware, but you've also got to have the capacity and the willingness to follow that commitment through. Mm -hmm. You know, And I think that that's where the inner work is so crucial and actually can't be skipped over because if I don't have the capacity to be present with my own discomfort and pain and suffering, I can't be present with yours. Something will happen at some right. point where I unconsciously disconnect because I, I won't be able to cope with it. And so this is where like, if you really want to make a meaningful impact on people's lives, even if it's just starting with your, your partner, your children, your, your mom and dad, you know, whoever if you're a leader the people that work for you you've got to start with you as, as cliche as that is you've got to actually get to know yourself and be comfortable with who you are because when you reach that place you know the beauty in it is you will naturally be that person for basically every person you come into contact with you'll, you'll be a permission granter you'll be someone that that brings light to darkness for people yeah, I think that really hits home with me because so when I first met Hannah, she had openly told me that she deals with a lot of mental health and depression issues, right? Mm. And I had thought, okay, well, I'm so fine that maybe I'm not going to understand you or like you have to get over it. Mm. And it was kind of a way of me projecting saying that I needed to work on some self myself mm. to help her, right? It's not like I'm good, I'm going to fix you. It's okay, you're bringing this issue to me. Now I'm not dealing with it well How because I, I have to look inside and be like, oh shit, I, I have some stuff I need to work on to help somebody else. Mm. And I think, you know, seeing what she was dealing with and what she needed help with allowed me to fix myself first fully, mm. right? And then allow myself to help her. Mm. So yeah, I think that makes so much sense. And totally. yeah, I can really relate. Yeah, that's exactly right. And there's some simple, you know, ways that if, you know, if you're listening and this is hitting home, simply just becoming aware of your triggers, you know, what what puts you in a state other than centeredness and balance, which is probably a lot of things all the time, you know? And this is, this is the depth in you that um, is yet to be explored because there's a possibility that all of these things that throw you off center, that make you feel irritated, frustrated, um, angry, avoidant, anxious, you know, sad, all of these um, triggers in your experience are opportunities for you to dive into deeper and deeper states of self-acceptance. Yeah. Know? So my mom, right, she is one of these happy-go-lucky people and always wants to be like, she was, we, I have three brothers, there's four of us, right? So she was, that's a, that's she, was she was a boy mom, right? <laughs> yeah. 
And she always just tried to be really strong for us, right? So mm-hmm. she never showed any weakness and it was just always like, everything was great and I got your back. And we've been dealing with some stuff, some family issues the past week or so. And I was talking to her and, you know, just getting deeper into her side of the story and her venting to me, she opened up and was just explaining to me like how she would break down and vent to herself in private. And she said to me something that I'll never forget. She said, telling you this right now is making me feel so much better because I've never told anybody my vulnerabilities, right? I've never told anybody my issues. And she didn't even realize, like she wasn't trying to be profound. She was just saying, oh, telling you this right now is making me feel so much better. Mm -hmm. And I immediately thought, yeah, because people need to share their issues with other people because not that the other person could help them, but it's going to make that person feel better just getting off their chest and just getting it out into the world. Well, it was, it's been how human beings have both connected, formulated bonds, and also shared information and wisdom through centuries. <laughs> you know, like story and expression through communication is the most, you know, fundamental way that we have evolved, quite literally. Like, back in the day, we were sitting around a fire at the end of every day, and we were um, Australian Indigenous people call it yawning. We, we had a young and that, that's how we shared information and we got to, you know, be there for one another. And um, it's, it's when you look at the evolution of that, you know, the fire became the, the radio, the radio became the TV, the TV became sitting in different rooms on iPhones and iPads, you know, and that evolution has disconnected us from this sense of um, tribalness because back in those days when we didn't have the um the food and the water and the shelter we actually were completely dependent on one another we were completely interdependent on one another to survive and we still are actually yeah. because that that's how we're wired i could give like a full scientific kind of explanation as to why but the short version is um one of the beliefs i've really had to contend with in my work is well no humans are actually innately selfish we will act in self-interest as a default and it's not true when you study our hormonal system when we're in a state of fear and survival yes we'll act in self-interest because it's it's a life or death situation we're not designed to be in a fight or flight state all the time but because of the stresses of the modern day we are Mm -hmm. we're usually in a fight or flight unless we know how to emotionally regulate but our true hormonal system is geared towards craving oxytocin which comes with closeness and touch and it helps create um, trust. Serotonin, which is a sense of, I will experience serotonin if you as my friend achieve something amazing. For example, I will feel a rush of serotonin because I feel proud of you. And these are examples of how we're actually hormonally and chemically wired as a human being for a reason, because our evolution literally depended on us feeling good when we were close good when we could trust another human being. And so when you look at some of the narratives in our culture scape at the moment, no wonder we're struggling so much because we've been really removed from what's actually most fundamental. Yeah, and I think you really need to check out this article about the US Surgeon General because <laughs> he just touches on all this stuff that you were saying. And the one thing that really sticks with me is he said that statistically the healthiest people on earth today are the people who socialize the most and have meaningful um, interactions with people Blue zones. and the people who have deep connections with other human beings mm-hmm. because if you have those deep connections and you have that daily social interaction you're creating those chemicals inside of your body that you were talking about mm-hmm. that is needed with the human society yeah yeah that's right that's awesome yeah um, really cool <laughs> Uh, yeah, you've been you've been kind of answering a lot of our questions <laughs> organically, which is great. One thing I was curious, I saw on the website the golden ratio of love. Mm-hmm. What is that exactly? The golden ratio of love is, uh, to me, it's a way to describe the fabrics of existence. This is going to get really philosophical. Deeper than we're getting. Wow, yeah, I love totally. that. <laughs> well, you know, the mystics of the world, like one of my favorite mystics um is the poet Rumi Mm. and 
what he expresses in his poetry is, you know, what I think science is coming to um, actually validate. That there's an interconnectedness and a oneness in all things. And he expressed it in, in obviously a, a very poetic way, like um, uh, beyond the land of right and wrong, um, exists love, I'll meet you there, you know, like he, he had a beautiful way of kind of describing the, the, the place that is the most true, which is beyond separation. And then you have people in history like Charles Darwin, whose um, earlier work before um, survival of the fittest is so rarely cited. He wrote a, a theory called the theory of artificial barriers earlier on. He was a botanist and he actually studied oneness um, in nature. And the work that he created before survival of the fittest, which is obviously the work that became most um, renowned, suggested that the key to our evolution as a species is actually compassion, um, which I find really fascinating because what he saw was nature is only ever seeking more of itself. Rumi said love is only ever seeking more of itself. Um, what Darwin noticed was humans are intricately connected, but we create these artificial barriers, these barriers of social class, of nation state, of sexual preference, of race, of whatever, you know, level of education, but these aren't real. And literally on a scientific atomic level, it's not real. I am you and you are me quite, quite literally. And I think the more you awaken, the more you see, I am the one, you know, we are the one. And the golden ratio of love, you know, to me is Fibonacci was, was also communicating the same thing, that there's this fractal pattern which is um, a loving force behind all of creation that we can never, ever be separate from. And that's like, I think the biggest cosmic joke of it all, that, that we fight against something that is guaranteed at the end of the day. And we create all of this pain and all of this suffering and, you know, violence and um, power imbalances and greed. And at the end of the day, we're just facing off with this inevitability which is we will have to surrender to that oneness and that love eventually because it's the truth. Mm -hmm. And everything up until that point is just this like soap opera, you know, that that's uh, inviting yeah. us to like wake up, you know, wake up to, to that reality, that truth. Yeah, I think if, if more people thought this way, well, people probably do think this way, but like you said, it's a soap opera and it's a game and there's, um, so many bigger things at stake when it comes to governments and stuff. Um, and it's interesting because like on social media, say there's like a little girl with cancer, right? And it's, it's, the story's about this one girl, right? Or it's an old man who like can't afford, you know, to buy groceries, right? As humans, we become so compassionate about those stories <laughs> that we could raise millions of dollars in seconds. And it happens every day, right? This story goes up, this little girl's got cancer. She needs X amount of dollars for the surgery. Within minutes, boom, she's got it, right? And I think because we're so empathetic and sympathizing to that one person, mm -hmm. it really gets home with us. But on a grander scale of society, yeah. when it comes to these programs or yeah. helping other people, we're not as attached to it. And we're like, well, screw it yeah. because it's not my problem. Mm -hmm. And it creates this game, this lobbyism, this, this yeah. disconnect with humanity, totally. which is disgusting. Yeah, you're so, you're so right. And that's... That's exactly how this um, sort of virus can exist. It's the dehumanization. It's the ability to listen to the news and say, and, and hear, you know, X amount of people died in war in a country on the other side of the world and not and have that not register as, well, what if that was my, my brother? What if that was my friend? What if that was, you know, because I think we've really had to deal with um, so much sensory input. I think that has a lot to do with it, that being so overstimulated in our society has created this kind of necessity to disconnect because if we were to feel everything all the time, it's a pretty overwhelming world that we're living in, you know? Yeah. It's like, how, how do we go from listening to a news story about um, like the the, the war to watching celebrities outfits at the Met Gala like it's 
fucking insane kind of yeah, contrast. Well, you know, with the like... war, right? When the war first happened um, in Ukraine, all you heard about all day, 24-7, was the war, right? Now it's a couple of years, or a year and a half in. It's like, oh, it's part of yeah, the, the normal mainstream. day. Um, but I think even in the dating app world, right, that that endless amount of options and that disconnect with the person on the other really? side yeah. is just creating such a big issue where one person is taking that so personal where the other person is just treating that profile as a connection and not a human being Mm. and it's creating more loneliness and more depression and more anxiety saying why did i get rejected by this person or why did he ghost me or or Mm. why did we not fall in love and it's because it wasn't starting off on a genuine deep personal connection it was starting off on a you're a number you're one of a thousand one of the so one of the endless amounts of people that i'm going to try and connect with today and i think that's the problem with dating apps right now and just why like if if that is you you know just really ask yourself why what is it in you that needs that sort of superficial validation of a thousand matches over actually one meaningful connection because that's the word validation trace it, you know yeah if you were to trace it back to the core it's not coming from a place in you that you want to sustain that much i can't guarantee you know it's not you don't um deepen your experience and your true happiness and joy and fulfillment in this life existing that way yeah and i think i think validation is just such a key word and a hot word right now because the whole world is just looking for validation in so many different ways yeah and they don't realize that like you said if you had one meaningful connection mm-hmm. versus versus a hundred random connections that one meaningful connection is going to validate you so much yeah whereas a hundred people oh. liking you <laughs> is going to validate you for a second <laughs> and then the next day you're going to be going through the same process again trying yeah. to get uh, validated again it's an where that well. one person will always be there because you created an actual deep connection with them whether it's a friend or mm. anything yeah just the simple principle of like are you treating someone the way that you wish to be treated just th- just that yeah just, I, just, I, I, just if you contemplated that well i was know? thinking about that the other day <laughs> if every guy and i'm sure there's a lot of guys who wouldn't think this way anyway but if most men treated every woman on the other side of a dating app, the way that they would want their mother, sister, or, or totally. daughter to be treated, they would friends. not act the way that they act right now. Totally. They, Even if they're not into somebody, they would approach it with a little more compassion and empathy and understanding. Mm. But we don't, we don't see it that way because it's so quick and so fast and mm-hmm. so validating. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and then we're also not, you know, we're, we're on our phone swiping strangers and missing you know everyone in the real world that we could actually be connecting with as well so it's yeah it, it runs really deep and it's, it's actually a dopamine addiction you know if we were to go into like why this exists it's it's seriously chemical like the the validation that you get from um notifications is oh, is, yeah. is like crack cocaine for the yeah. brain like you've got to be really really careful i remember like six years ago i was in mexico and i was I went there with with this woman right and she took a, a photo and she put her on instagram and the whole day she was just checking her likes right mm. and i was like shoot like this is so bizarre like why does she care so much about her likes <laughs> and the other day we must have put something up with the app or i put something up and i just kept refreshing to see the likes and i was like wow <laughs> i have I've become that person. Yeah, humanity has evolved into everybody acting that way, whereas yeah. maybe she was just ahead of the game five years ago, <laughs> being like, oh, I want to see the likes. And now every person, and Give I was doing likes. it, I was like, how many likes do you get? How many likes do you get? And I'm like, you got to stop. Like, who cares? <laughs> yeah, out of control. How man. many likes the damn thing got? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, and are you going to be thinking about that on your deathbed? You know, is that is that going to reflect right. on your life and be like, I'm so happy that I refreshed my Instagram feed a thousand times that day when I was 30 something and well and handsome and had every single opportunity, you know, and that's how I chose to spend my time. And I think that's really healthy, <laughs> but I think it's really healthy when people think about their deathbed, right? Because I, hope so. I think about it all the time. It's like, what do I want? I want hopefully in a perfect world to be surrounded by people who actually care that I'm leaving. And I'm like, 
Exactly. The, the joy and happiness that he brought to the world will not be here anymore. And we have to remember him through some type of way versus being around people who are like, oh, I guess I have to be here for this guy's death. And the next day, they're probably just go about their life and be like, oh, yeah, he died last week. That sucks. <laughs> I don't want that. I'm glad, I'm glad that's your aspiration. Be that's a good one. Uh, well, that's actually a good segue into this question that I know you ask, and that's how's your relationship with your legacy, hmm. right? I've seen, seen you talk about that a little bit. Uh, can, you, can you talk a little more about that and maybe like the most important thing or things hmm. that people should think about? Legacy is a big subject. <laughs> how do you feel? I wanna, I wanna know how you feel about this because I was listening to Joe Rogan yesterday and he's very anti-legacy. Me too, hmm. in a way. In a way, yeah. I, I say legacy should be just a byproduct of how you live your life, and you shouldn't. I, I shouldn't say you shouldn't. I don't want to try to live to create a legacy yeah. in any way. I just want to live a certain way, and then whatever my legacy is as a result of how I live. Yeah. So, I'm about to publish my next book, which is actually titled Legacy Disorder, and to your points, it's a um, sort of a diagnosis of where we've skewed our relationship with legacy um, and how that's affected the world. <clears throat> it actually explores quite deeply the concept of um, mortality as, as kind of a guiding kind of concept, which is, I do think it's really important to contemplate death. And when you look through history, most tribes, most cultures have had rites of passage that force that contemplation at a coming of age um time in your life so when a when a boy is about to become a man or a girl is about to become a woman every culture except ours basically has had a rite of passage whether that be sending um the 12 year old boy out to hunt a tiger by himself in the woods which was his separation from the tribe um his you know coming into his manhood and then bringing the tiger back and being celebrated and acknowledged as a man or some kind of subsequent ritual the psychological importance of those rituals was it forced um, at that age of stepping into your psychological maturity in your adulthood, this understanding that oh, I'm not, you know, the, the universe doesn't center around me and um, this is, this, this is going to end. And it allows you to sort of not be so attached to the material. And this is where I think we can actually live a true legacy. But because we've, we've created a culture where there's so much um, emphasis on um, having a legacy, you know, w which is more so anchored in like living so that you will get the acknowledgement, living so that you have the material that would really miss the point. And so the, the book actually aspires to reframe um, true legacy as this acceptance that um this isn't forever and use that as a as a place of power and motivation to kind of live in the, the truest most authentic version of yourself to the best of your ability in all moments mm -hmm. and also be willing to serve um well willing to serve full stop <laughs> and more um more than that be willing to serve something that you may not see the fruits of in this lifetime you know, I think that that's a really important principle, especially right now. And in the absence of that, we, we don't ask the right questions when it comes to kind of our, our broader evolution. Because if we're attached to, I want to see the fruits of my efforts in this life, you know, in my life. I want to see the material 3D manifestation of, of all of the love I give, of all of the hard work I put in. Well, then we, we're really doing a disservice to the future of humanity. And so how do we become comfortable with that? Because it's, it's one thing to, to say, yeah, I want to serve a legacy that's going to, you know, be um, beneficial for humanity for the next thousand years. It's another thing to be okay with the sacrifice that that might ask of you now in a material sense, you know, and to forfeit the need for acknowledgement to forfeit the need to be seen in that and and just literally fall in love with the the fact that we get to serve 
and that being the truest you know highest version of ourself actually at the end of the day is what i think we're ultimately here to actualize mm. so you think that a lot of people try and live or leave a legacy based off of it being selfish where they want to reap the benefits while they're still alive or see those benefits come through fruition while they're going to the next world or whatever happens to them when they die mm-hmm. instead of just living living by their legacy and letting that play out naturally yeah that and and to your point you know not um not being attached and the attachment is you know it's the same it's the same expression as like the the desire for the material it's it's if you're attached to something then you're you're stuck in a certain level of consciousness mm-hmm. but to really it's a superficial level of consciousness you know because you're needing that thing and i think that the drive to to actualize a legacy to fulfill a need in you is um yeah. is not legacy at all you know it's, it's a very disordered view of legacy yeah i have to think about this question more because I, I always or still do think that part of what I'm trying to do is to try and leave a legacy, right? Mm. To try and leave an impact on the world. But thinking about the way that we're breaking it down right now, mm. maybe there is a lot of selfishness and mm. validation to this legacy. So, man. As long as you're willing to look at it. It's, yeah, this is it's, it's all the journey. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's a big ask, you know. I think it, it becomes a spiritual it becomes a spiritual path. It becomes a path of renu- renunciation, mm-hmm. where you're no longer you know doing it for what you're gonna gain. Yeah. Um, yeah, but the world needs that right now, <laughs> you know. Like unless we're willing to put our egos aside and be like, okay, let's really come to the table wholeheartedly with a willingness to serve the greater good. We're gonna really experience a lot of suffering. Yeah. Uh, you touched on this a little earlier, but can you talk a little more about the idea of love-based thinking versus fear-based thinking and how people can, mm. how we can, you know, kind of use this in our everyday life? Yeah, totally. This is a great question. So out of all of the tens of thousands of choices you make a day, which can be very overwhelming to think about, try to just come back to this understanding that we're really only ever making two um, choices from a vibrational standpoint, and that's love or fear. And to make it even simpler, it's expansion or contraction. So when you're choosing, which we're always doing every moment, even not choosing is a choice, um, are you, is, is that choice guiding you to a, a space where you're in love, therefore um, inclusive and creative and expansive? <clears throat> um, or is it making you feel contracted, which is, is fear-based? which is judgmental and separate and critical. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that we can quantify the symptoms of these two, two states. Like love is divergent um, and kind of limitless. You have this sense of anything is possible. You're, you're turning towards um, lack instead of fear, which is shutting yourself off from it. And that's a, if you just practice that one point of awareness, it's quite amazing how transformative that is. Mm -hmm. Just noticing where in life are you contracting? In relationships, maybe for your listeners, this is uh, specifically more relevant, um, is the way you're showing up in your relationship or relationships generally with friends and family, whoever, um, are the choices you're making bringing you closer to that person or are they taking you further away from them? you know, and this is love or fear-based um, understanding, it's incredibly powerful just through the practice of, of that, how much I've been able to achieve and grow. Because at every intersection, I've, I've just come back to that place and asked myself, like, am I choosing love right now? Am I choosing to expand into this? Or am I shutting myself off from it? Can you give me like a really specific example or two? Of like just like something simple that happened today that you, you know, really, for you it's probably yeah. So uh, you unconsciously do it at this point, choosing love over fear in terms of your actions, and I'm sure you need to reinforce it also. But like something simple that happened today that would be an example of, you know, doing something out of love versus fear. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, sometimes um, I get really overwhelmed with the amount of um, like texts and phone calls, you know, and that that can, if I'm stressed and I go into a, a closed state or a state of fear, <clears throat> the action in that can be like, even when someone that really loves me is calling, um, I just scream the call rather mm. than being like, hey, you know, maybe I don't want to talk to them for ages, but just saying like, hey, you know, I'm a bit overwhelmed right now. It's not a great time, but I love you and let's let's chat soon. It's those small choices, um, which when you think about the accumulation of that, because I've also been in times in my life where that overwhelm and stress and fear has been so great that I've screened those calls for months and months and months, mm. you know, um, as an example. But the impact of that, you know, in a moment, it just seems like you're making one choice. But the way that that then will manifest, you know, um, in terms of the quality of your life, the quality of your relationships, your level of expansiveness, you know, um, and ease, actually. Because when we go into that state of contraction and fear and avoidance, we're actually, <clears throat> we're creating dis-ease in ourselves because we're, we're resisting something. When I work with people as a facilitator, this is what I'm facilitating. Like, where are the points of resistance? And how can you get people to let go of the resistance and actually step more into love? And this is where potential is actualized. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think about, you were talking about this um, with our crew, like, if, if you're meeting these uh, circumstances that, that really scare you, like, what are you going to do? You, you've got to if you want to move through it, you've got to put one foot in front of the other and you've got to um, be be willing to, you know, not try to accomplish or conquer the whole forest, but just get to that next, that next, um, that next section. And to me, that's what choosing love is. It's like continually saying yes. Yeah, I think, I think that it actually resonates with entrepreneurs as well. Totally. Um, and there's like, you the total love affair, always. Yeah, and, and they say, <laughs> you know, they always say like, um, it takes more energy to hate than it does to love. Mm -hmm. That's also so true when you go through it. But, yeah. <laughs> but we always get comments, right? And we always compete with other dating apps and other brands, right? And it's so interesting to see when you lead with hate, right? Where people come in and say, oh, you know, your dating app sucks. My dating app is better. And, <laughs> Do you, you know, really receive that? oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> We get so much hate stuff, but <laughs> mostly TikTok. But it just, <laughs> it just, um, like other founders of dating apps. Oh, yeah, and and then our response. I would be always, so disappointed if I was their shareholder. This one founder, I'm not going to name the app, but has a dartboard with Joe's face in the middle, <laughs> and sends Joe videos of him trying to get bulls. But my response is always this, right? Love you, man. It's Sorry, like, you're receiving enough hugs in the show. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting because my response, in the way that I think, is. I don't want to rip down Tinder, Bumble, Hinge, or any other app. I just want to create a different niche and a different market, and hopefully people like that as well. And when people come and attack us, I say, hey, um, I, I'm glad you think that your app is better than ours. I don't think our app is better than yours. Our app is a little different, but I hope that you succeed and you do well. And it actually makes me feel really good. And their response to that always is very startling where they're like, oh shit, this guy didn't attack us back, which they wanted and expected. Yeah. He came from a place of love and it made them respond back and saying, totally. oh, you're right. You know, yeah. we wish you guys the best. Like we actually like your app. And it's like, well, why did it take you starting with a place of hate for me to get you back to a place of love? You have to be the leader. Good job. <laughs> I think it's time for our speed dating rapid fire hot seat interrogation round. Presented oh. by Remedy Kombucha, Nicole's drink of choice. Not actually presented, but we would love for you to sponsor us. <laughs> um, but yeah, so these are just some rapid fire questions so people can get to know you a little better yeah. if you're if you're ready. I think so. Okay. Interrogations. Okay. Sounds intense. Uh, what is the best thing that happened to you today? My beautiful friend John, who's been looking after my car, surprised me by getting it detailed when I flew into San Diego today, and that was just such a loving thing to do yeah wow great to john. To john and chatting to you guys yeah wow. um, we'd love that thanks yeah. we'll, we'll take sec we'll play second fiddle to john that's <laughs> yeah. a nice one. uh what is the best compliment you've ever received um someone walking up to me at a members club and saying okay you're either a professor or a rock star which one is it nice 
<laughs> That's pretty cool. Okay. <laughs> Uh, what is your favorite date spot? Could be anywhere in the world. It's a uh, it's a hotel in um, my home city in Australia, and they've got a really epic um, like outdoor pool and bar and restaurant, and there's a beautiful view, and I have really great memories there. Great. What's the name of it? Emporium. Cool. Uh, what's your favorite romantic comedy? That's tough. <laughs> That's serious. That's seriously tough. Um, can love actually be considered a rom com? Yeah. Yeah. yeah for sure. Probably, 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 probably love actually. What is it? Love actually. Love actually. Okay. Um, uh, what's a movie that made you cry? A lot of movies made me cry. That's <laughs> First one that comes to mind. Um, Notebook. Okay. Like uh, I think the last person time. said this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> books. yeah. What is your go to karaoke song? Mm, uh, Meet Me Halfway. Nice. Black Eyed Peas. Um, <laughs> if you could have a drink with anyone living or dead, who would it be? Um, Rumi. Who? Rumi. Oh, Rumi. Yeah, yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah. Drink with a mystic. Mm-hmm. What is a mystic? Uh, like a, a mystic, mysticism is a way of seeing life. This is a very poetic, mm-hmm. um, philosophical way. Is it? They were like the the old school philosophers. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, do you have a quote or mantra that you live by or a favorite? <clears throat> Love out loud. Love out loud. Love that. <laughs> that was not a that was not an intentional plug. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's something people don't know about you, or at least most people? A lot of things, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I would say. I don't know. I've lived a very colorful life. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I feel like we can get to know you for like five more hours and still not know half of it. What advice would you give to 18 year old Nicole? Or 18 uh, year old Joe? 18 year old Steve? So this is, this is a deep 18 question. 18 year old Joel. Deep question. 18 year old Nicole <clears throat> had to, against so many perspectives around her of where she was at with her health I really had to get to this place where I stood up against all of these opinions that believed that I didn't know what was best for me and choose to live my life and I was so scared that I was going to make the wrong choice and I would just say to her like you've you've got this you know You've really, you've got this so much more than you realize. Hmm. Cool. And last one, going off that, currently, what is your biggest fear in life? Mm. Biggest fear. Not writing the best love story ever told. Hmm. Does that mean like a real life love story or, or, or a book? No, like a like live, like with my soulmate and also my life in in general. Love it. That's amazing. That's yeah. a great answer. Uh, and then Joe has one of his favorite questions yeah. as well. If you could have one law in the world, what law would it be and why? Law. Mm-hmm. That everybody had to follow. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and it can't be love out loud. Choose love at all costs. Like that, that's it. That's my law. It's like, no matter how inconvenient it seems, just do it. What's the, what's the fine or penalty if you don't? If you break the law? Um, You've got to stand in the middle of a circle, which is what I call an acknowledgement circle, and you've got to literally receive acknowledgement and love from every single person, like, in the world, which would be a painfully long... Oh, wow. That would take a long time. Uh, I saw this in Ted Lasso. Are you caught up with Ted Lasso? No. No spoilers, Uh, please. Well, there was a scene, and... One of the it characters is. says, don't do that. Lead with love because it will piss them off more. Yeah. And he's like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You yeah. don't? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, cool. Uh, anything exciting coming up? I'm sure you have a lot of exciting things, but what's, I would say this will probably come out in like six weeks. So okay. anything coming up um, yeah. in the next couple months that you're really excited about? Anything launching or? Well, I will be getting pretty close to the launch of In Truth. Okay. Uh, so our um our tech product which measures emotion in real time 
Um, so yeah, I, I'm pretty excited about that and I'll definitely be very excited about that in two months from now. Can you explain to me, cause I don't really, I've heard of it, Joe was telling me a little bit about it, but how does it work exactly? Yeah, so it uses HRV to basically um, measure your emotion in real time. So the interface will be able to see what your emotional state is, mm -hmm. um, which obviously will support you to regulate if you need to. But the thing that I'm even sort of more excited about is the application of being able to see your emotional patterns over time. So on a simple level, being able to look at your calendar, um, you know, at, in retrospect at the end of the day and see how your day actually emotionally affected you. But then in a more complex application, actually looking at the nuances of your emotional patterning, um, what affects you, why it affects you, how it affects you. Um, because I really do think that this is the, the gateway to, to true sovereignty and, and freedom when we understand you know, ourselves. And I really, really, really believe this product is, is gonna make serious waves in, in helping people understand themselves. Amazing. Yeah, I think it's going to change the world. And um, Sam Harris was on Jay Shetty's podcast the other day, and they asked him about uh, the law that he would have, <laughs> yeah. and that everybody had to be honest. But you brought up a great point to me about your product in the sense that it will be harder for people to lie, politicians or people in yep. court, if they're wearing this totally. technology, it'll track their true emotions, which, again, I don't know how people will accept this, mm. because a lot of people need to lie. but. <laughs> I think it's going to change the world. So that's awesome. Even the other way around. So if it's not them wearing the tech, like one of the applications that um, the features I'd love to, to build in eventually is say like a running news thread, <clears throat> but then it has the collective mood of um, how people responded when they read that news headline or whatever. So, or if it's like a video of a politician giving an address or whatever it is, you'll actually be able to see the collective's response, the collective's emotional mood. Um, towards that thing, which I think is also an indication of truth, you know, because wow. if, um, I don't know, a, a politician's getting up and giving what's meant to be this really inspiring speech, but the collective mood is actually tension. Yeah, yeah. well, super interesting in the sense that, like, you see all these people at Fox now, right, where yeah. they were promoting all this stuff and millions of people are believing it, but they themselves, when the camera was off, we're like, that's not true, <laughs> but they're like spreading it yeah. to the whole world. And if that technology is out, you yeah. could track in real time and saying, okay, this guy is flying to us. Totally. Yeah. I mean, it's really, it's going to be very fascinating to be able to, to segment this type of data, you know, to be mm. able to see how different communities, countries, demographics are, are faring at, at scale. So, you know, I think that the individual application is so transformative and then also the collective application is just you know so exponential without you know going too out there um because of how i see the world i really understand that where we direct our emotion literally our energy and motion our attention is where um the world will start to materialize now imagine if you had a hundred million people that were um that were users of this and there was like some crazy announcement like we're going to enter a nuclear war but we actually had a way of sending a push notification to those hundred million people and said, you know, do you, would you be willing to calibrate to the emotional state of peace? And we could at scale facilitate a um, hundred million people coming into internally a state of peace. What I know about quantum physics is it would actually become an impossibility that a nuclear war could happen because on a vibrational level, it just, it can't exist. So, that's I'm how stressed I about that now. Yeah. I'm like, oh, am I going to get drafted tomorrow? <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> and this has actually been studied. Like, uh, I posted about this actually yesterday. That there's been meditation, mass global meditations, where a million people have meditated around the world, and then crime rates have been studied, and disease and death has been studied, and these rates have gone down for 24 hours, mm. um, or so after the mass meditation. And so there is science that, that have validated this and proven this, but I think where we've um, maybe fallen down, and of course, like so many amazing leaders and prophets which have spoken about this too, um, but we haven't had a system 
that's organized humanity to be able to direct their collective consciousness other than the mainstream media, <laughs> you know, at, at scale and help people understand, wow, I actually am contributing to reality. You know, my vibrational state matters, my attention matters, where I put that, invest that matters. So yeah, when I when I think about sort of the the grandest application of what we're developing, that's what I think about and that's that's pretty cool. I think I have some fear based thinking happening right now because I'm I'm just thinking of the government and the yeah. MSM using this for evil. Uh -huh. <laughs> kind of just make people scared all the time. Well, yeah. We, um, that's why companies like ours have to become the leaders. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I have one more question. You you mentioned a couple times having the ability to recognize and then self regulate. Mm -hmm. Are there certain little tips you have, like with that? I'm sure it's very complicated, but how to self-regulate? It's, it's really not complicated. Oh, I mean, great. You've just never been taught. I mean, breathe. That's a great place. Okay. To Is start. there a certain breath? Because I would, you always say like, oh, yeah. There's like the box breathing, then there's seven second this. It's like, is there a very specific one that you have? Yeah. So if you're, um, okay. So let let me explain sort of this first. When when you're looking at emotion from a clinical or scientific point of view, it's a combination of two different points of data. The first is arousal. Um, so if you're in a high set of arousal or low set of arousal, or valence, which is, are you negatively geared or are you positively geared? Mm -hmm. And so if you were measuring excitement, for instance, um, you would be uh, geared positively in valence and you'd have high arousal. So that would be excitement. If you had high arousal, but you would, uh, your valence was negatively geared, you'd probably be like angry or mm -hmm. frustrated. And then um, high valence, low arousal would be like calm, you know, love. Um, low valence, low arousal would be like sadness mm -hmm. and everything in between. Got it. Um, if you're in a high state of arousal and you want to come down, you want to activate the parasympathetic nervous system. So you want to breathe in and out of your nose. But if you're, um, you know, in a low mood, maybe you're sad and you want to hype yourself up, then um, you want to stimulate, you know, um, the breath probably through like, <sighs> so that you're actually increasing your arousal. Mm. So it really depends like the breathing pattern that would be suited depending on where you want to sort of go, you know, on, on the emotional spectrum. But it is quite amazing that the way we breathe is constantly signaling to our bodies how we feel. So when you're anxious, you, you'll block, you know, your um, your lower diaphragm and you'll start to breathe from your upper, you know, and you'll shut off your feelings. And like, interestingly, Aussie culture um, is known to be, you know, not <laughs> that emotionally connected. And when you listen to the Australian accent, for the most part, it's like very nasal, like, g'day, mate. And it's, it's cutting off all of the emotion in the body. And it also then affects the way that we breathe. And yeah, it's, it's pretty fascinating how all of it ties into the way that we feel. But a lot of us don't know how our system works, mm. you know? So we, we don't know how to change how we feel, but you can change how you feel at will because the thought form um, is not also a manifestation of, of your feelings. So just like Joe Dispenza says, you can change your thoughts and it will change how you feel. You can change how you feel and it will change your thoughts. It's, it's this interconnected relationship. But if you just begin by presence and breath, like my preference, I sort of have a low, my temperament is calm. You know, I don't, I don't really enjoy being in like a heightened state. And so, my breathing pattern um, emulates that. Mm. You know, it's a slower breathing pattern, and I usually breathe through my nose. Nice. I'm yeah. always in a heightened state. Yeah. I'm always running around. Uh, and where can people find you online? Um, pretty much anywhere. Um, my Instagram handle is Nick Gibson. Only yeah, Definitely not on the phone. Just, just, just DM me, and then we'll see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, pretty much all platforms with my name or Nick cool. Gibson. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. I loved it. Thank yeah. you, Nicole. Thank you, guys. We're going to be doing a lot more stuff together. <laughs> it's, totally it's, just the it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. You can find us on Instagram at First Rounds on Joe, at Steve Roster underscore, and most importantly, at First Rounds on Me. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching or listening. We'll see you next time. For now, check out one of our past episodes.